Hey, she's got that green applesauce pouch again. Ginny, want these chips? I've got cookies. Guys, you know I don't trade my go-go squeeze. Seriously, no one asked their mom yet? I did, sort of. You just gotta remember the name. Go-go squeeze. Let her know it's delicious. 100% fruit with no bad stuff and totally good for you. What's it called again? Go-go squeeze. Go-go squeeze. Made with 100% fruit and no artificial anything. Goodness on the go. Find it in the applesauce aisle today you're listening to the spark radio network internet radio like you've never heard before innovation creativity and imagination are all said to begin with a spark so fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark you are listening to klrn radio where liberty and reason still reign Most writers and radio show hosts know that to connect with your fans, you need to do more than just write books or record the latest podcasts. There are many different elements that go into forming an online platform, but there are also many hidden traps. To make matters worse, solid advice on how to survive the muddy waters is scarce. In the book Hidden Traps, I talk about some of the important issues of working with an online platform, highlighting traps that could put your physical or internet security at risk, or be harmful to your reputation. Are your social media posts just links with a few disjointed words making you look like someone who can't complete a sentence? Did your new website cost you more than you anticipated? Are you leaking your personal contact details across the web without even knowing it? Then you need Hidden Traps. Hidden Traps is now available in paperback and ebook from a variety of retailers, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Kobo. Visit blackwolfpublications.com for more details. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. Here's George Foreman with InventHelp. Hi, I'm George Foreman. Do you have an idea for a new product or invention? People ask me all the time, George, how do I get my idea in front of companies? How do I get a patent? What do I do next? Do you have the same questions? I'll tell you like I'll tell them all. Call my friends at InventHelp. Call InventHelp today for free information. InventHelp has been helping inventors for more than 30 years and has sales offices nationwide. InventHelp can submit your invention to companies who are interested in receiving new ideas. If you have an idea and want to try to patent it and submit it to companies, you should call InventHelp today for free information. Listen, I can't guarantee a company will be interested in your idea, but I believe every inventor deserves the opportunity to step into the ring and take their best shot. Put InventHelp in your corner. To get your free inventor's information, call 1-800-353-6490. That's 1-800-353-6490. Again, 1-800-353-6490. At St. Jude, a family never sees a bill at all. It's like the world has been lifted off of your shoulders. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Finding cures. Saving children. Learn more at stjude.org. Sometimes riders feel lost, unsure why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing into full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, offering manuscript critiques and line edits through a mentoring editorial style. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's bio for your websites. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services, visit blackwolfeditorial.com. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Sometimes we need to slow down and remember the simple pleasures in life. Good coffee, good books, and good company. Come on in. Take a seat. The coffee's just been brewed. Let's see who we have in the coffee shop today. What a beautiful day in the coffee shop. 
There's someone over there with a whole stack of books. Aria, Aria Grace, how are you? Hi, Jesse. I'm great. How are you? Awesome. Good to finally catch up with you. You've got quite a few books with your name on them. I do. Yep. There's a lot here. Wow. And you picked one to talk about? Wow, that must have been a a, a struggle. <laughs> it is a struggle, but this is one of my favorites, so that makes it a little bit easier. I bet. And which one did you pick? So it's called Choosing Happy. It's actually book three of the More Than Friends series, and it's one of my very favorite books. Okay. So what makes Choosing Happy your favorite? Um, This was kind of um, the first real book that I wrote. Uh, Before this book, I had done several novellas and um, was still just kind of learning how to tell a story. And um, it wasn't until, you know, about a year into my writing that I, I finally sort of figured out how, how to do this uh, writing thing and was able to put all that together into a a full book that people really um, liked in, in a way that they um, didn't appreciate well, uh, that they really liked um, a lot more than, than the novellas. Okay. So you w- worked on improving your craft to tell a mo- more cohesive, coherent, emotionally driven story. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I got a lot of uh, feedback in the reviews about um tell more, develop the characters more. We want to hear more backstory. We want to feel more emotions from the characters. And so, uh, you know, it took me a little while and a little bit of trial and error to figure out how to do that. And I think it finally kind of came together with this book. Well, that's great. So I can see why it makes makes it one of your favorites. Now, can you tell me a little bit about who your main characters are and what the overall plot is in Choosing Happy? Yeah. Um, so the the first character that you're going to meet is Steve, and he actually um, made appearances in some of the uh, earlier books. And I can tell you, nobody liked him. He made a few bad decisions. And um, when I announced that I was going to be giving him his own book, uh, readers started writing to me saying, you know, he, he better redeem himself in a big way because nobody liked him. Um, and so with this book, we really see a, a kind of growth um, path for Steve when he meets Joey. And Joey is a slightly younger man who is in a bad relationship and is um, trying to find a way out. And so Steve reaches out to him and offers some help that um, I think really surprised a lot of readers. And and we got to see his softer side. So Steve goes from being the bad guy to saving the day. Yes, exactly. (laughs) I think that's called redeeming yourself. He's a tattooed, like, tough guy. So, um, yeah, I think people were surprised by the way he turned out. I know a few of those tough guys, and some of them can be absolute kittens on the inside. Exactly. Yes. That's always a nice surprise. So you were telling me, and I was I was kind of letting you tell about the book, the genre is gay romance. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. I love a romance. I, I'm probably going to get killed and slaughtered for this, but I even read all four of the E.L. James Fifty Shades books. <laughs> okay. Now, my favorite was actually Grey, which is the one she tells the first book. Yeah, yeah. I loved that book, yep. Christian's perspective. That was actually my favorite because I felt like I was actually getting into his mind and getting more into the right. psychology in the book. Yeah. But, so is that the kind of approach you take with this or do you take a different approach? Was it hard to write a gay romance? And I'm peppering Um, you, I ought to slow down a minute. So was it hard to learn to write a gay romance? 
Um, it was, uh, you know, the first few, um, you know, just attempts at writing were just traditional, you know, I think a lot of writers kind of start with erotica because it's, um, it, it sounds easy <laughs> and we all think like, okay, well, you know, let's just write down some things that I've thought about. Um, and so that's where I started, but when I, um, really started writing different scenes, I realized the ones that I just really liked the boys a lot more. And so putting them together and kind of ditching the girl all together was a lot more fun. (laughs) I can see that. Now, I'm no writer, but some of my best friends are guys. In fact, most of them. So how long did it take for you to write, write choosing happy? So that's, um, Actually, it was one of the fastest books that I've ever written. Um, and I think it, the story just happened to flow really quickly. Like I, it had been kind of churning in my head for months. And so when I finally sat down, I think I probably finished it in two or three weeks. Um, it, it was, it was pretty quick. Um, and that kind of spoiled me for future books, <laughs> thinking that they would all um, come so easily. And unfortunately, that has not been the case. So it took you two to three weeks to write the book. Did you mm-hmm. then go through an editorial process or use an editor or have a beta reader or that other set of eyes I'm constantly hearing about? Yes, for sure. Um, so I had two close friends who um, were into the story who had, who had um, already been following the story beta read it. And I did use an editor um, to do the proofreading and kind of the grammatical checks. And, um, and honestly, I think there's probably still a few typos in every book, just because if it's a good book that people get sucked into, it's easy to miss the little things here and there. But um yeah, there were several people that went through it before it actually hit the shelves. Well, personally, <clears throat> I think that makes a better book if yeah, you can get rid of, of some course. of those flaws. Because someone one time gave me an arc, and I'm never going to name the name. I couldn't get six pages into it. <laughs> and I'm not a grammar Nazi. And I wanted to bring out the red pen and fix the typos and the spelling mistakes. I mean, it looked like it hadn't even been spell checked. Yeah, I've I've read those, and um, it's worse when you pay money for them, and that happens too. But yeah, there's there's good and bad to self publishing. So you did go the self publishing route. I did. Yeah, um, a lot of my friends had been self publishing successfully, and. You know, like most new authors, I kind of felt like, well, there might not be a single person that ever buys my book. So let me just put it out there and see what happens. And um, it's worked out very well for me. So I don't have any plans to to change that. I, I really um, am an advocate of self-publishing. Well, my opinion is self-published, traditional publish, hybrid, crowdfunded published. They're all welcome in the coffee shop. <laughs> Good. It's a book. Of course, I exactly. want to re- want to get all get all over it and find out more about it. You know. Yep. So when you fin- finish, how did you come up with the title "Choosing Happy"? Um, because, like I said, with this particular character, he had a dark side and um was kind of taking some of his misery and his um sadness. Uh, out on you know he felt his sadness and he sort of took that out on other people and at some point throughout the story he kind of makes a conscious decision to not be miserable anymore and to choose differently and to do something that is not in you know is not normally the way he would go but is maybe the right way to go and it worked out for him Okay, so how far into the book, if you haven't read the first two novellas, how far in does the romantic and the all the steamy stuff happen? Well, um, my books tend to, and this is uh, 
not intentional, but it just the way it works is that the good stuff tends to happen at the end. <laughs> There's a lot of angst and a lot of build up and a lot of teasing until the moment of truth. Um, so in this particular story, um, there's definitely the angst and the tension. And um, it's probably about halfway through before there's even a kiss. And then it slowly builds from there. Personally, I think that's fantastic because it makes for a more realistic story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think um it's nice as a reader. I know I like reading books that um it you know, I kind of develop the relationship with them and I feel all those emotions with the characters and the excitement and the the fears and um insecurities and yeah, it takes a little while to get past some of that. So you finally made Steve who is a crab apple, for lack of a term here, into mm-hmm. a nice guy, and you've given him a romantic partner in life. I'm yes. sure there had to be more drama, or we would not have books. Uh, four, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Yes, <laughs> yes. So um, the the basic plot of this story is that um, Joey's in a bad relationship, and he um, escapes from the control of um, like kind of a known mob boss. And this guy, Topher, um, runs a male brothel that um, Joey didn't work at, but he kind of was like Topher's property, I guess, um, in a way. And so when Steve decides that he's going to help Joey, he has to confront Topher and make it clear that you're not getting him back, basically. But there were some debts, financial debts and um, involved, and Steve has to uh, figure that part out. And then there's also, um, and because he doesn't feel that paying off the debt will be enough to get you know, to appease Topher, um, they have to go a few steps further to make sure that they can have their happily ever after. So, um, yeah, there's a little bit of action. Does Steve know he's gay at the beginning of the book or is it something he discovers along the way or? Yeah. So in this story, they both know and they're both out and um, have been in relationships in the past. Uh, Steve was in a a good relationship that he kind of screwed up and um, a few years prior and then since then he's kind of been in this downward spiral and so that's where we um, we first meet him where he's kind of taking everybody down with him. Um, But each book is actually its own couple. So it's not Steve and Joey's story throughout the entire series. Um, We, we meet them in this book or we, you know, really get to know them in this book. And then we see them to the end in this book. And then the next book is about other characters. Oh, wow. So do Steve and Joey make any guest appearances in the other books, you know, passing mentions? They are. They are certainly mentioned in probably all of the books. Um, And I wrapped up the series. Um, So the last book in the series, book 10, is called Choosing Us. And it actually goes back to Steve and Joey. And it is a menage story where um, they add a third person to their relationship. And so they are unique in this series where they get two full books. Um, but again, they tend to be everybody's favorite couple. So it just worked out that way. You kind of had to bring them back if they're your reader's favorites. Yes, completely. I agree. Although I had a lot of people saying, you better not screw things up for them by bringing them a third. So (laughs) it was a very delicate, um, situation to take that risk, but, it worked out. I think everybody was pretty happy with how the series wrapped up and, and their story wrapped up. So 
Is this the only series you have out? Do you have, what are you, okay, you wrote ten, ten, a 10 book series. I know you didn't yes. stop writing. Nope. So after that, I went back to another book that I wrote a few years ago. And um, when I wrote the the book, uh, When It's Right, I expected that to just be a standalone. And when I got to the end of this More Than Friends series, I thought, well, you know, I think I can, let's do this again in Denver. So I went back to um, this standalone book and I kind of expanded it. And that started my next series and I'm actually um, in the process of writing book 10 the very last book in that series it's called the mile high series okay so is the mile high series another gay romance series or you got to tell it me it is that. yeah yeah that seems to be where my sweet spot is um I've tried a few male theme or like um hybrid romances where there's males and females and males and males and I've done a few that are just um, traditional male female erotica and those have not done as well I don't know if I'm just not as good as right um, at writing about women <laughs> um, or if that market's saturated or you know whatever the case is but um, the the gay romance seems to be what people want to read from me and it's what I have the most fun writing. So I was just about to ask that. Is that what you enjoy writing? It is. I do. I love these guys and um, it's a lot of fun. Now for people who regularly listen to coffee shop, they're going to find this as a little bit of a surprise. (laughs) I, I have confessed many times on air that I am a thriller I, my first love is thrillers. But I'm going to tell you guys, I got a few romances on that Kindle. I got 3,000 books on that Kindle. You think there isn't <laughs> a little bit of everything hiding in there? And I do have a few that are favorites. I'm just not telling you which ones. But so, I even as a thriller, and the reason I mentioned that, even as a thriller reader, just the sound of how you develop and grow the characters has enticed me and makes me want to read it. So I definitely think you're onto something here. Good. I hope so. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to um, attract people who maybe have never considered a gay romance or never really thought that that would be something that interests them. And, um, you know, just maybe open their mind a little bit and um, encourage them to consider that love is love and however it looks and is... um, comes together, it's all good. And that's why, again, I'm putting myself out here. I saw the Fifty Shades bit as a romance with a weird twist. And that's yes. literally how I dealt with it. And it it makes a beautiful romance. You just have all these crazy twists that throw in. But that's what I think kept the thriller side of me going, ooh, what's next? Exactly, yep. You you did want to find out what was going to happen next outside of the bedroom or the dungeon. Exactly. (laughs) So you are finishing up a second 10 book series. First of all, I am in awe. Aria, I I am surrounded by writers. I have writer friends. I obviously talk to writers routinely. Writers, authors, wannabe authors, the whole nine yards. But yet... I sit down, and I have tried NaNoWriMo. I have tried repeatedly. I get about 5,000 words into it, and it's like, this doesn't just doesn't bring me any joy. It's no fun, and I'd rather be off doing about 20 other things. So I'm assuming for you, your writing is one of those things you enjoy, you love, and it's a labor of love. Definitely, yeah. It's, um, I find myself creating, and I didn't realize before I actually started writing that I had been creating these stories in my head my whole life. And so it wasn't until I started actually typing them out that, um, all the, the little scenarios that 
come to mind when I'm looking at people in the grocery store, when I'm listening to a song um, or watching a movie and imagining what happens after the, you know, the credits roll, what happens to those people? What do they do with the rest of their lives? Um, So finally having an outlet to kind of put all those thoughts and little fantasies and scenarios uh, out there has been really fun and kind of therapeutic in some ways and just a a great um, way to, to share all the, the little stories in my head with others. I think it's fantastic. And I also have to commend you when you, how, when, can you tell me when you released your first gay romance? I think it was 2012. Gay. Correct me if I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. I'm a news junkie, but I do get dates wrong. Gay marriage was a hot, controversial topic. Yes. It was only legalized barely in a few states, and other states weren't recognizing it, and certainly not the federal government. Right. And here you did. You took on this issue. In a way, you weren't necessarily taking it on head-on, but you showed people that love is love no matter what size, shape, or form it comes in. Exactly. And I'm yeah, sure, and I think... I was just going to say, I'm sure that wasn't your intent to make a political statement, but I do think that takes some courage on your part. Well, I do use it as a little bit of a soapbox now and then. <laughs> um, I think that's that's natural, and I try not to get political or too judgy or too preachy. But, um, you know, it is a a way to kind of force people to look at maybe some of their um, stereotypes, some of their prejudices, some of their preconceived ideas about people and attitudes and beliefs and, and just make them question like, wait, why do I hate this kind of person? Why do I think that this is bad again? I don't even really know why I think it's bad. And so maybe it's not, you know, my opinion and I have, I deal a lot with the military community, so I'm around a whole slew of alpha males. Yes. The best kind. And I have friends in the Special Forces community. I don't know if you looked up my bio at all before you came on. A little bit. My first husband was a Special Forces, a member of the Special Forces, and I am the proud keeper of his casket flag. And then I couldn't stay away from the military. I remarried another active duty member member of the United States Armed Forces. Wow. Moth to a flame, I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> but that means well, I, I still have all behind those every ties. good man is a strong woman, so thank I still you have for all doing those your ties. duty to support him. Well one of my uh fallen husband's buddies came to me this past year and said I need somebody to talk to. I need somebody who's connected to the community that I can trust. And I was like, you know me, I don't gossip. And he's like, thank you. And I'm not going to give his name or even what branch of the military he's in. And he sat me down and said, I feel I need to tell the guys. I, They've been to my left and my right for years. They don't know this one thing in my life, and it's huge. And he actually came out to me, and I was the first person that had ever seen him in a military uniform besides his boyfriend that knew. Wow. And first of all, I gave him a hug and said, it doesn't change who you are in my eyes. My opinion falls on public display of affection. I don't care if it's male, female, male, male, female, female, keep a lid on it. (laughs) And that's, and don't force anything on me. I won't force anything on you. And keep a lid on the public display of affection and we're all good. <laughs> yeah, that's and fair. That's my whole take on it because love does come in many shapes and sizes. How else could I, after, for lack of a term, the, the military being the source of the biggest tragedy in my life, that knock on the door telling me my first husband wasn't coming home, then find myself a few years later head over heels over another person that wore a uniform. And it was just, you can't explain it. You love who you love. And there is no rhyme, reason, 
or explanation. If love made sense, <laughs> we might be able to figure out some kind of formula, but last I checked, the love per- potions from Hogwarts have not made their way to to reality yet. Yeah, there'd probably be a lot less babies in the world. <laughs> so it's one of those things of, I think it's a phenomenal thing that you did. I think it's phenomenal that you had the courage to, first of all, admit to yourself that this is what you enjoyed writing. And then continue down that path and create multiple variations of it. Now, well, it's a, it's an... Uh... It's becoming a more popular genre for sure, but when I first started writing, there just wasn't a lot of, you know, modern gay romance out there. And so um, the people who liked reading it, uh, once they, you know, the Kindles were invented and you could read privately and you could kind of read anything that you wanted to without people looking at the cover and making faces or judging you or whatever, um, you know, that really freed people to pursue the things that interested them. Um, and I got a lot of letters from from women saying, you know, I love these books and um, I love the stories and it's really cool that you're writing them. And then I also got a lot of, of um, feedback from men saying, this is my story. Like, that is exactly how I felt. That That's how it went down for me. I feel like you were there that night or whatever. Um, and so it's just, it's been a really um, powerful and moving journey to hear these stories and to know that, you know, I may be making uh, some people's lives a little bit happier or making them feel a little bit more accepted or a little less different or, um, you know, whatever the case is. I've got to say, I think it's incredible what you're doing. And I was going to ask, how did you research this? Or did you just make it up all in your head and hope you were right? Or did you have gay friends that you were able to openly have these conversations with? Um, In the beginning, it really was completely made up. <laughs> like It was all just fantasy of how I thought that things went and how I thought it all worked. And, um, you know, the very, very first books, I think you could probably tell (laughs) that uh, I didn't quite know what I was talking about. Um, They're not completely far off, but um, it's taken a little bit of time and research, uh, you know, talking to gay men, you know, having those kind of open conversations. Now it's a lot easier because I have a lot more friends uh, in the publishing world that are authors or just, you know, fans that are willing to answer any kind of question. Um, but in the beginning, uh, yeah, it, there was a lot of like, I hope that this is making sense because this is how I think it should happen. I was wondering about that because I know I talk a lot about research with some of my other, you know, sci-fi fantasy authors and other authors and it's I believe that getting sometimes getting those details right can be important but I also believe (laughs) in suspending disbelief yeah exactly that you know I mean just like I don't know exactly how a you know vampire digests blood or a shifter changes from one form to the next or an alien can fly whatever um you do, this is fiction and you do have to just kind of go with the story. And I think that a reader enjoys a book a lot more if they just follow the intent of what the story is. And, you know, maybe a fact is a little bit exaggerated or like you mentioned, sometimes the romance or the, the insta love happens a little too quickly. And well, you know, sometimes that happens. I, I will say I can suspend disbelief to a point. But if you suddenly do something absolutely crazy that makes no plot sense, like you put the Washington Monument in downtown Detroit out of thin blue with no basis in your plot to back it up, and it just sudden how, somehow now exists in Detroit, I will say something major like that is going to turn me off. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's hard to get past things like that, for sure. But if it's just... You know, you're, it was just a little bit off 
but it still makes sense in your world, then it's all good. Yeah. So I hope I'm making sense actually myself. Of course. Yeah. I mean, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, definitely. I think that um, when, when an author is writing any kind of fiction, they do have to put themselves in the place of their characters and, um, you know, doing the appropriate, there's certain research that is required. I mean, like there's certain biological and physical aspects that you have to understand. You have to know how things work in order to get those scenes right. Um, but then there's also, you know, the emotional side or, you know, it, there are people who do fall in love at first sight. You know, there are people who do take two years to recognize that their best friend is somebody that they actually love and want to spend the rest of their life with. And then there's everything in between. So, you know, I think that it's, um, it's just a matter of wanting to enjoy the story and, um, putting yourself in the characters as they are, whether they make the same kind of decisions that you would make or make completely opposite decisions or, or things happen to them in, in ways that have never happened to you. But this is the story and, um, you know, hopefully you like it. You know, maybe not every story in a series or every book is as good as the last one. But uh, like you said earlier, they're all books. So you can't really go wrong with just about any of them. Yep, you just hang on for the ride and see what happens next. Speaking of what's happening next, it is time to pay those radio station bills. So, Aria, I'm going to ask you to hang on with me while we take a commercial break, and we will be back with you on the other side. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. If you're 85 or younger, would you like peace of mind and comfort for your family? We're Final Expense Direct with an urgent message for you. The average funeral today costs over $8,000, but the most you'll get from government benefits is $255. How will your family pay the difference? We can help. Our senior plans start as low as just a dollar a day and pay up to $30,000 for a funeral and other final expenses. Peace of mind is easy. There's no medical exam. You'll have lifetime coverage, and your plan can't be canceled as long as you pay your premiums. Call now for free information about our senior plans. Answer a few simple questions and receive approval right on the phone. Plus, call right now, and we'll give you a discount prescription card for free. Call 800-553-8687. That's 800-553-8687. Again, 800-553-8687. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. Everyone loves liberty. Our rights come from God, not the government. So why are you letting other people tell you what's best for your health care? Exercise your freedom with Liberty HealthShare. Liberty HealthShare is a community of people who voluntarily share one another's medical costs. Liberty HealthShare is founded on the idea that most people truly want to help one another. Healthcare sharing allows members to do just that as a true community that supports one another in times of need. Liberty believes people should make decisions for themselves and their families. Members are able to take back the freedom to make their own decisions about their health care. Freedom from guilt or doubt about how your money is used. You have the freedom to direct your health care, not to be dictated to by bureaucrats. Stop letting others tell you what to do and join a community of like-minded people. Exercise your freedom. Join Liberty HealthShare and take back the control of your health care while helping those around you. Call Liberty at 855-58-LIBERTY. Again, that's 855-58-L-I-B-E-R-T-Y for more information. Or you can check them out at libertyhealthshare.org. Again, that's libertyhealthshare.org. 
Here's George Foreman with InventHelp. Hi, I'm George Foreman. Do you have an idea for a new product or invention? People ask me all the time, George, how do I get my idea in front of companies? How do I get a patent? What do I do next? Do you have the same questions? I'll tell you like I'll tell them all. Call my friends at InventHelp. Call InventHelp today for free information. InventHelp has been helping inventors for more than 30 years and has sales offices nationwide. InventHelp can submit your invention to companies who are interested in receiving new ideas. If you have an idea and want to try to patent it and submit it to companies, you should call InventHelp today for free information. Listen, I can't guarantee a company will be interested in your idea, but I believe every inventor deserves the opportunity to step into the ring and take their best shot. Put InventHelp in your corner. Get your free inventor's information, call 1-800-353-6490. That's 1-800-353-6490. Again, 1-800-353-6490. At St. Jude, a family never sees a bill at all. It's like the world has been lifted off of your shoulders. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Finding cures. Saving children. Learn more at stjude.org. Sometimes riders feel lost, unsure why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing into full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, offering manuscript critiques and line edits through a mentoring editorial style. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's bio for your websites. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services, visit blackwolfeditorial.com. All right. Thank you all for hanging in there with us while we paid those radio station bills. Yes, unfortunately, bills are a necessity in all walks of life. Speaking of walks of life, Aria, how did you get started in writing? Well, you know, I um, loved reading as a child and kind of took a break from it when I started having kids of my own and I got busy with you know, my husband and family and all that. And one day I was in Target and I saw a copy of Twilight and I'd heard all about it and the movies were just out and I figured I'd pick it up and just see what it was all about. And that afternoon I finished the book, had to drive back and buy the rest of the series. Um, And it kind of took me back to the world of reading that I'd forgotten about. And I, I was just so such a crazy Twilight fanatic that I started reading fan fiction. And when I found fan fiction and realized that there were all of these regular readers out there who just loved the story so much that they started writing their own, it kind of opened up a whole new world for me. I started to get to know these authors. I became friends with them, started beta reading for them and, you know, doing editing and stuff. Um, And that really got me on the path of of being inside this writer's world. And um, eventually, I just decided, you know what, I think I could try it too. And so I sat down and wrote the first little short story, sent it to a couple of the friends, and they're like, you know what, I think you you need to give this a try. And so it really all started with Twilight. And I know that so many of today's Um, contemporary authors can say that, you know, Stephanie Meyer, E.L. James, J.K. Rowling really, you know, got them back into reading and ultimately um, into writing. And so, yeah, that's where it started, my Twilight days. I think that makes for a fascinating story. What would you tell to someone who wants to try writing, but they're not sure where to start? I would say just sit down and do it. You know, you don't need fancy equipment. You don't, don't, I would say don't do it on paper. That's going to just make your life (laughs) crazy. But any, you know, word processing, Microsoft Word, that's what I use. Just sit down and get it on paper. Don't worry about structure. Don't worry about, you know, the rules of building a plot and story arcs or any of that stuff. Just tell your story. And um, once you, once you get in the habit of documenting all the the voices in your head and and you can you know put those characters onto paper um it's a lot easier to go back later and then you know connect the little plot inconsistencies or fix timeline issues or things like that um i know some authors really like to plot out everything in advance they have a very strict outline and they stick to it 
I've never done that. And even when I do try to come up with five sentences that describe the whole book in advance, only the first and the last one are actually part of the book at the end. So, um, you know, if you don't know where to start, just sit down and, and come any scene that comes to mind, type it out and then just let it flow from there. I think that is great advice. Now, you mentioned that you you edit for your friends. So do you also have an external editor that you use for your works? I do. Um, I learned very quickly that um, even though I had been telling people from the beginning that you can't edit your own work, I tried it. (laughs) I thought that I was beyond and above um, the average person. But no, you definitely need uh, other people and and outside eyeballs who don't know the story that's inside your head to read it, to make sure that it makes sense and to find the little inconsistencies that you thought you can, you corrected because in your mind you told yourself to go back and correct it. Um, so I have a couple very trusted editors that I use for all of my books and um, you know, it's definitely a, um, important in order to put out a quality product that people will enjoy versus one where they're constantly being jarred from the story or like, wait, I thought that person's name was this. And is there supposed to be a the in that sentence? Because it doesn't make any sense. You know, that really does kind of ruin the story for a lot of readers. Now, the other topic that I always ask about, cover art. Do you get your covers professionally done? Do you design them yourself? Do you come up with the concept and then pay someone else to bring it to life? Where do you come up with these covers? Well, I do have a background in marketing and I'm familiar with graphic design software. So I actually did all of my covers myself until pretty recently. Um, So it was just with the... A current batch of the More Than Friends series. So it's a white cover with a black and white guy on each book. Um, That is the first series of books, of covers that I had professionally done. All the rest and all the previous iterations of this series, because this is probably the third or fourth set of covers that I've used on this particular book series, um, I did myself. And I just used stock art and, um, you know, Tried to make it look not too amateurish, but um, they're, the the covers now are significantly better now that I'm paying an, a real artist who has a really strong design aesthetic um, to do them. So for an author who's just starting out, doesn't have a big budget, and can't afford a lot of money... Um, unless you know how to use the software and and can really put together something that looks like a lot of the other books that are going to be on the shelf, I would say try to find a professional. Um, you can find a, somebody to do a cover for 50 or or $100 if you look hard enough. Um, and at the high end of that, you know, maybe a couple hundred dollars, um, but it doesn't have to cost a ton. And it, it really is your first impression and your first chance to attract a reader. They always say don't judge a book by its cover, but I think everybody, including yours truly, is guilty of doing it. Exactly. Because I know sometimes something on that cover will attract my attention. It could be something in the background that wasn't meant to be a main part of the cover, but it kind of tells me where the book is set. And it's like, I like that country. So I want to read this book. Yeah, exactly. And and that's what a good cover will do. It will give you just enough to pique your interest um, and make you shell out a couple bucks to read more, find out what it's about. I am guilty as charged on more occasions than you want to know about. My husband <laughs> swears half my income goes to books. Yeah, you're not the only one. And thank God for for people like you, <laughs> for readers like you. Oh, and if I fall in love with an author in their series, it's over. Every book they (laughs) they put out will be on my Kindle. Because we have a house rule. You get to pick two authors that you put get actual physical book copies for. And usually that's a hardback. 
and then everything else has to be digital because we are military. We do move every three to five years and you do have a weight limit. <laughs> That's right. Books do take up a lot of space if you if you want to feel them in your hands. But God bless the Kindle and its ability to store everything else for us. Oh, Kindle is amazing. So when what you, um, do you have a day job or do you make your living off writing or I do have a day job. I live um in the Silicon Valley in California and um I have to sell a lot of books to pay my mortgage here. So um I haven't gotten to that point yet that I can uh, retire from corporate life. Um I do corporate marketing uh, for a tech company. Um, by day, and um, I I fit in the writing in every possible moment that I can outside of that. So do you get up early, stay up late? I stay up very late. Um, I put my husband to bed at around 9, 9.30 every night with my kids, and then I go back out and um, dig into whatever book I'm working on. Um, and then I'll usually try to find if I'm on deadline or really trying to finish up a book, then I um, will do a lot of dictation. Like while I'm driving to and from work, I can usually get a chapter dictated in each direction uh, while I'm driving um, or at lunchtime, I might walk to a deli down the street and while I'm walking, I'll dictate and then I can, um, you know, that night at home, clean up the mess of dictation that I've done. But that really helps me to um, get in my word count every day. So do you have a daily word count goal or how do you judge Um, your progress? Yeah, I'd like to do at least a couple thousand words a day. And if I'm dictating, that's easy. I can I mean, on a good day, I can do eight to 10,000 words a day. Um, if I'm not dictating at all, like if the kids are around and um, because I'm not writing kid-friendly books, so <laughs> I have to have, um, you know, alone time in order to uh, speak them out loud. But um, if I'm just typing, then, you know, 3,000 words is a good goal. Of course, there are days when I'm lucky to get 300 But, um, you know, you have to have goals. How do you handle the inevitable, every author has faced it that I know of, writer's block? (laughs) I start calling up friends and saying, help. (laughs) You know, I have a couple trusted friends that I can call at any time and say, okay, so-and-so is at this point. I just had them do this. Now I need them to do this other thing, you know, halfway through the book. But, ah. what do I do in between? And then we kind of talk it out a little bit. And usually they'll come up with some crazy suggestions that don't really work at all. But inevitably, it'll spark something that, okay, I I think I've got an idea now. I think I can work with the one word you just said that, you know, I can take in a different direction. And, and that will generally get me back on track. Um, because, yeah, there are definitely times where I just have no idea Like, I can't think of a funny thing to say, a single conversation the characters can have, uh, a way to move from one scene to another. It definitely happens. So you lean a lot on your writing community. Is that local or online? Or how did you meet all these other writers? Well, initially I met them through my fan fiction addiction, Um, just, you know, as a reviewer and, and you know, excited reader of fan fiction. I got to know some of these authors um, and a couple I became very close friends with. And, you know, we started to meet in person, even though we lived in different states. Um, And then I started attending writers conferences. And that's really where I've gotten to know most other authors. For the most part, it's all online. I don't have any author friends that live, you know, within a 50 mile radius of my house that I can have lunch with or anything like that, uh, unfortunately. And I'm on the West Coast, so most of the writing conventions happen on the East Coast. So uh, they don't even come 
in my direction too often. Yeah, so it's really just all online. Um, we talk through Facebook. We've got, uh, I'm in a lot of groups. Um, I've got a few people that I email with on a pretty regular basis, and we just kind of keep each other accountable and check in to make sure we're doing what we're supposed to be doing and <laughs> finishing up and, and, you know, keeping our work in progress is on track and all that stuff. I'll say, because I deal with the writing community a lot, I've stumbled into the writing community on Twitter. Now, is that something that you're involved in or would that be a place where a new author, a new writer could reach out and try and make friends or? You know, honestly, um, I've not gotten that closely involved with the writing community on Twitter. So for me, I can't really recommend it. Not not that there's anything bad. I just, I haven't really experienced it. I certainly have a Twitter account. I certainly follow all of my writer friends. And very occasionally I check in to see what people are doing. And and I post even less occasionally. Um, or I'll tweet something. But I've heard that it is a very active community. I just... Um, because of the time lapse, like unless you're, you know, when you're on Twitter, you see what's happening right this minute. And so for me, it's just hard to kind of keep track and to keep conversations because I am looking at it at midnight in California, which is 3 a.m. in New York. And um, so it's just it hasn't quite worked out for me. So I have better luck in the Facebook groups, um, of which there are many. And um, I can usually follow threads a little bit better uh, on Facebook. Okay, so you think that Facebook might be the way to go for a new writer looking for other writers to learn from? Yeah, I think so. I would definitely recommend joining some um, author groups or author and reader groups and um, <clears throat> just you know, asking questions there or lurking and seeing what people are talking about, what when when um, authors are talking about different advertising techniques they might have used or if they're looking for group promotions, if there's opportunities to get involved with a group uh, media purchase or something like that. Um, it's a great way to get yourself out there without having to have a lot of personal relationships until you build those personal relationships. That sounds like fantastic advice. And I always do try and make sure there's a little advice for the listener out there who, believe it or not, some of my listeners are, I have a unique conglomerate of both writers and readers that listen to my show because they know I include the tidbits about writing and kind of peek, peel back that curtain a little bit with my authors. And so I've gotten responses of, can you ask the next author that you have on about this or that? And then I've gotten ones that go, oh my gosh, I heard about this book on your show and it was great. Da, da, da. So yeah. that's that's why I go into both sides because I love I love the books, but I'm one of those people, I always want to know more about the person behind the book. Yeah. So is there anything that we haven't touched on that you wanted to bring up? Um, well, I guess I'll just end by saying that, um, you know, if your author, if, if any aspiring authors or if any of your readers are interested in um spending some actual time with me. I'm going to be doing a Romance on the Sea cruise in October. Well, it's the end of September through the first couple of days of October that um, sails out of Galveston. And I, I've never done a signing like this before, but it just seems like it'll be so much fun to, you know, be on a ship with a bunch of readers and a bunch of authors and we're just hanging out and singing karaoke and talking and, you know, getting immersed in books. So um, any everybody's welcome. And I'd love to uh, have some of your listeners out there. Oh, that sounds like such fun. I can't imagine a cruise filled with books. Ah, my luggage <laughs> exactly. would come back. And, my luggage would come back 200 pounds heavier. I know me. Exactly. I'd end up having to take almost no clothes just to meet the weight requirements of flying home. Yes. Well, that's the secret of the empty suitcase. Yep. All right. So I, as at the end of every interview, I always give my authors a chance to give out all their social media information. All right. Well, anybody trying to get in touch with me, um, the best way to reach me is just good old fashioned email. It's ariagracebooks at gmail.com. Um, if you are a Twitter user, uh, I do check in on Twitter 
with um, at Aria Grace Books. And my Facebook site is, you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash Aria Grace Books. So it's pretty easy to track me down one way or another. Well, Aria, I thank you for joining me in the coffee shop. And for those of you trying to track me down, whether you want to get in touch with one of my authors and you didn't catch their information, or you want to be a guest on the coffee shop, yes, all authors, self-published, traditional published, one and all are welcome. You can email me at jessie, J-E-S-S-I-E, at klrnradio.com. Or you can find me on Twitter at jessie's POV at klrnradio.com. Well, it is time for me to pour myself a cup of coffee. And settle down with Choosing Happy. And I will see you guys next time on The Coffee Shop. Switch to Sprint and register to get tickets to Jay-Z's 444 Tour. Don't miss your chance to witness history. Tickets are first come, first serve. And right now, Sprint customers get six months of Title Hi-Fi on us. Visit a Sprint store or Sprint.com slash Title today to learn more. After six months, pay $9.99 for Title Premium. Require service plan sold separately. Ticket offer quantities and venues limited. Register after 14 days of service. Customer must be in good standing. Offer not everywhere. Restrictions apply.